Hey, my friends, it is so great to be with you. I'm truly honored to stand with you. You are a bunch of fighters for our Lord Jesus Christ. So let's begin as we always do with the sign of the cross. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. You know, we seem to be at the height of the revolution, or maybe even the height of the revolution, the revolution against Christianity, against God. You know, we have Christianity fearing being wiped out in certain parts of the Middle East. Many churches have been closed, have been shot, have been bulldozed in all sorts of places. But you know, the secular persecution of the church here and in all of the West, in Europe, in Canada, my home country, it's actually just as severe. But that was nowhere more evident than last week. On the Feast of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, in the month of the Sacred Heart, Major League Baseball, the institution of the United States, through their a huge team named after the Angels, Los Angeles, honors the most anti-Catholic hate group in America. How is that possible? That's not possible except for in an antichrist time. Now, at the same time, the church is riddled with the crimes of clergy, which have brought its reputation and moral authority to an all-time low in public, in public opinion, such that the clergy are ashamed, sometimes afraid, of wearing their clerical clothing in public due to the overt hostility. Priests walking through the airport are called pedophiles. They hardly dare getting on planes in their clerics. But I have a message from Mother Miriam for all of the priests in the room. She says, wear your clerics nonetheless. <laughs> that was from today, a text. I asked her for prayers for Bishop Strickland. And uh, she knows I'm here. And she said that to me to remind all of you good fathers, don't be afraid of the persecution. It will come, but embrace it. That's her whole charism. Everybody know Mother Miriam. If you're wondering, she's on life site every day. We get her from Virgin Most Powerful Radio where we have a partnership. And uh, we started doing it video-wise where they were doing it first audio only. And then... It's gone totally viral, and uh, she's amazing. Her whole charism is walking the streets in a full traditional habit. And she says how when she does that, even non-Catholics are amazed. And once she met a guy who was not Catholic at all, not even Christian, but he met her with tears, and he said, where have you been the last 50 years? <laughs> Fathers, I can't tell you what it does for us, laity, to see you walking in your collars on the street. But while all of this is going on, for men and women of faith, the most devastating reality of our day is the crisis of faith in the church, where many of the hierarchy, including the Holy Father himself, are gravely confusing the faithful with failure to preach the truth. At times, in statements both official and unofficial, contradicting doctrine. I said both official and unofficial, and we'll get to that. Because a lot of people think all of the commentaries, all of the laundry list, which Father so generously gave us, um, is all made in off-the-cuff comments, but they're not. 
We've seen the crushing of Orthodox clergy and religious by their own superiors, the whole-scale abandonment of the underground faithful to the wolves overtly seeking to destroy the faith, and the promotion of the very wolves in shepherd's clothing to the highest offices in the church, and the ruthless attack even on young Catholics clinging to tradition. They're all signposts of our current agony. Remember in the Holy Scriptures, excuse me, in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, at number 675, thanks, Anthony, um, <laughs> we are told that there will be a religious deception offering men apparent, an apparent solution to the problems at the price of apostasy from the faith. And that's what we're facing today. We're facing the time when the Catechism tells us that the mystical body of Christ will follow her head, our Lord Jesus Christ, to the cross. And that's what we're experiencing right now. And it's nowhere more powerful than in the heresy coming from the Vatican. You know LifeSite News comes from the pro-life movement. And all the pro-life activists in the room, where's Janet? There's Janet. The longtime activists in the room will all tell you the same thing. Back in the 80s and the 90s, we still had unfaithful bishops, bishops who sort of hated the pro-life movement, but you always knew the Pope had your back. John Paul II couldn't go two days without saying some pro-life thing that we'd put on LifeSite. I kid you not, it was, I was told by my co-founder, hey, it's enough already, we're doing this every day, two and three articles, it's, it's, it's too much. It was never really too much, but in retrospect, oh boy, for those days. But you know, we saw that same thing with Benedict, and it was awesome, because the Pope always had your back. Before I go into this, I want to tell you something weird. For all of you who've known LifeSite for only the past decade, LifeSite's 25, 26 years old now. And it was a very different relationship that we had with the church. Yes, with individual bishops. That was always the case. It was, you know, one of the things some of the bishops used to say, is, have you been LifeSighted yet? And it, it didn't matter if it was good news or bad news because it was always uncomfortable for them at the bishop's conference. Speaking of canceling, we were canceled out of the Bishop's Conference of Canada. I used to go there and I would show up early so I could attend their mass and all the bishops would be together. I went there this one year after we exposed that they were funding pro-abortion groups overseas and then they did an investigation and found that, no, we were wrong, we were a counter-witness to the gospel. And then, one of the archbishops, in fact, the Cardinal Archbishop in Mexico, wrote that he wished the Canadian bishops would stop funding the pro-abortion groups in my country. <laughs> Unfortunately, the bishops of Canada never retracted their statement, which I was told by a very good cardinal that we should go to canonical court about. We never did, but nonetheless. So we're very used to the cancel culture at LifeSite. In fact, some of you may know we used to have a YouTube channel. We had a YouTube channel with 315,000 subscribers. I like to say we could sneeze and get 50,000 views. That was canceled in 2021, mostly over information on COVID, which was somehow then not accurate, but is now accurate. So that's kind of strange, but we were never granted the channel back again. <laughs> However, over the next two years after that cancellation, we built up another YouTube channel. This time we got almost exactly halfway, 157,000 subscribers. And again, it was going really well, and we got canceled again. And this time, we got canceled over hate, a hate policy. For what? What did we say that was so hateful? I did a movie review, a movie review 
of a movie called Everything Everywhere All at Once that won all the Grammy Awards. It's like a martial arts film, and I confess I like martial arts films. But when I saw it was a martial arts film, I was like, okay, great. And it was kind of a martial arts film, sort of, not really, and it was gross, and it was horrible, but worse than all that, it was very anti-Catholic. But the premise was all about homosexuality. It was about a girl whose mom, while her mom accepted her lesbianism, the grandfather was not told because the mom was embarrassed. That's sort of the premise of the story. The weird part is it's the evil part seems to be about the church, and I explained that. But I explained the Catholic position on our take on homosexuality. It's very simple. We don't hate. In fact, we love people in same-sex attraction enough to tell them that this behavior hurts you. It hurts you physically, and we can go through that. It hurts you psychologically, we can go through that. But worse than all of that, we're Catholic, so we believe there's an everlasting life. And we want you there with us and not somewhere else. It's a position of love. But that was deemed hateful by YouTube. So we're off YouTube again. Thankfully, we built our own uh, video server, so you can still go and see us at lifesitenews.com slash video. So please avail yourself. But thanks to Father, I don't have to go through everything on my list. But I'm going to tell you what I'm skipping. First of all, I'm skipping the Pachamama pagan liturgy in the Vatican, which Father went over so nicely. I'm skipping the Canadian reenactment of that, which most of you probably didn't see. But there was a shaman in Ottawa who did a pagan ceremony with the Pope and the Cardinals, asked them all to close their eyes and put their hands on their chest while he blew a bone whistle and called on the four directions and talked about the Western grandmother asking her to open the circle of spirits so they could join them there. But I'm skipping that. And I'm skipping the crackdown on the Latin Mass and the traditional orders. And I'm skipping the forced Vatican COVID shot, the forced church lockdowns, stopping the public celebration of the daily sacrifice of the Mass worldwide, not for, quite for 1,260 days. All of you should catch that reference. But only for nearly three months, from March 2020 to the end of May. And the closure of Lourdes, the healing place, during a pandemic. That made lots of sense. But I'm skipping that. We're skipping the cancellations of Cardinals Burke, Cardinal Zen, Cardinal Sara. Wait a minute, how do you do that with Cardinal Sara? Cardinal Sara is a very black cardinal. The black face of white supremacy. That's really good. Anthony's a good line guy. I'm just going to use his. Throw him in any time, Anthony. But how do you cancel a cardinal from Africa? Is that, how? You're liberal. That's how. They will do anything. It doesn't even matter. So we're going to skip that. We're going to skip also over the China underground church sellout with the secret deal, which had... Papally approved, by the way, bishops in China who are communist agents. And get this, they have wives and children. But we're going to skip that. We're going to skip over the Pontifical Academy for Life, getting rid of their pro-life membership requirement, and then bringing on pro-aborts. We're going to skip that. We're going to skip the Pontifical Academy for Sciences bringing in all the world's population controllers who were fought by the Vatican at the UN under JP2. The very father of population control, Paul Ehrlich, who wrote the book, The Population Bomb, he was invited to the Vatican. We did a huge petition, 15,000 people asking the Pope not to do it. He did it anyway. We called up Paul Ehrlich because we're a news agency and asked him, so what do you think? He said, I really like the direction Pope Francis is taking the church. We're also going to skip the um, population control, excuse me, the Emma Bonino thing. Emma Bonino, Italy's foremost abortionist. She did like 10,000 abortions illegally in Italy, then fled the country, came back, became a politician in the Communist Party. She, they passed abortion, same-sex marriage, and all sorts of anti-Catholic legislation. The Pope's like her best friend because he likes what she does with immigration. He said in the newspaper of the... <coughs> 
The Daily Newspaper, the most famous newspaper in Italy, said that she was one of Italy's forgotten greats. She's so popular, has met with the Pope so many times that she goes to speak in Catholic churches, but she's that same former abortionist now promoting abortion person. In fact, when America overturned Roe v. Wade with the Dobbs decision, she was out front public condemning it. That's today, you're right. Today, one year ago. And she complained, but she speaks in Catholic churches. But we're going to skip that. <clears throat> we're going to skip the Zika virus thing where the Pope allowed for contraception. That sounds so weird. We all called the Vatican to ask, at the time the head of the press, com press uh, of Vatican Press was still Father Lombardi. And I kid you not, this was Father Lombardi's answer. The Holy Father meant to say that in grave circumstances, we can have access to condoms and the pill. How is that even possible? But we're going to skip that. We're going to skip his comments from July 16th, 2016, which were about cohabitation. He said, cohabitation is real marriage and has the grace of real marriage. And my daughter called me from college to say, Dad, did the Pope just say cohabitation is real marriage and has the grace of real marriage? And you know, I've asked several cardinals who didn't want to talk to me about this stuff. I said, was I supposed to lie to my daughter? But what we're going to touch on briefly, since we had to skip so many things, is just, <laughs> is just the formal teachings, which are very confusing. So how many of you were into apologetics? So I was into apologetics big time because my wife was Protestant. She was an evangelical. Actually, like one of the good priests here, she was formerly a brethren, Plymouth brethren. So I was majorly into apologetics. When Scott Hahn was out and Kimberly Hahn, I'd just play those tapes in the car. Oh, dear, this is what I'm listening to. Just have a listen, but, you know, whatever. <laughs> and it was great. We used to have a line, because I love to debate people on this stuff. We used to have a line... The line went like this. If you, to our Protestant brothers, right, if you can show me one single teaching that has changed in the church in 2,000 years, I will join your church. You know what? None of us are saying that anymore. You could, but the argument would take way too long. So let me go through the formal things that I'm going to briefly touch on. The first one you all know about, everyone's heard about, Amoris Laetitia, right? <clears throat> it's, it's really weird because there was a document written by some smarty smart theologians that tried to do mental gymnastics to make it into a document that you could possibly read if you really twisted your brain enough orthodoxly. Honestly, they must have spent days and days making this, but they did. And people thought they were happy until the clarification came from the Pope in what's called the Acta Apostolica Seris, the rule book for bishops, which spelled out that the official interpretation, the only interpretation, was the heretical one that allowed for divorce, remarried communion. And they said it's authentic magisterium. So that's really head-scratching. But you know, in Amoris, it's not just divorce, remarriage, communion. There's a whole bunch of mess in there, and I'll give you just one, because we're only brushing over them. If you want the rest, talk to Peter Krosneski. He's right there. But here's the one. It says, no one can be condemned forever because that is not the logic of the gospel. Doesn't that sound weird? Now, some of those smarty, smart guys who interpreted it, they were like, oh, no, probably doesn't mean that because you can wiggle out of it. Except there's a problem with that. Here's the problem. So get this. Now, this is really weird. Everybody can know and find out. The ghost writer for Amoris Laetitia is an archbishop by the name of Victor Manuel Fernandez. He knew what he was doing when he put that in there because you know what? In 1995... Here's what he wrote. He said, I rely firmly upon the truth that all are saved. 
Oops. That's the ghostwriter for Morris. So if you want to know what it means when it says no one can be condemned forever because that's not the logic of the gospel, it's a pretty good indication. So that's Amoris Laetitia, but that's the one sort of everybody knows about, right? The next one we probably know about is the change in the catechism of the Catholic Church. Well, that's odd and weird. How does that happen? The catechism was changed with regard to the death penalty, right? It doesn't make any sense to call the death penalty inadmissible ever. You call into question all the former popes and the whole teaching of the church on the question. It's hard, especially as pro-lifers. That's not one where we like to go, but the church teaching is church teaching, so you do anyway. But it's contradicted. And now what? Now what happens to the 92 Catechism, which, again, apologists, really good priests, would always hold up the Catechism and say, follow this, because this is your ticket. You still can, except the Catechism's called Baltimore or Trent. So there's that. But I'm going to tell you one that you probably, the third one you probably know about too. It was actually because this one was the first one where a papal document called, got called out for heresy publicly by none other than America's bishop, Bishop Strickland. Bishop Joseph Strickland joined the other major, major hero in the Catholic Church today, whose name is the same as the hero of the Catholic Church during the Arian heresy, Bishop Athanasius Snyder. And that is no coincidence, folks. God is truly giving us hints. That's not his name in life. He wasn't born with the name Athanasius. He was given it in religion. And so they called Pope Francis or the document out for heresy because the document is Desiderio Desideravi. And this is so weird to say. So let me take you through a little bit of history. History, I'm sure you all know, but I'll put it together for you, and it's weird when you get to the end. So you all know Nancy Pelosi. You all know that Archbishop Corleone, after a decade of discernment with her, trying to get to her, working overtime backwards and everything, to do everything to convince her otherwise, said, that's enough. He was convinced in conscience he had to deny her Holy Communion. He had to go through with Canon 915 because she was an obstinate public sinner. And so he said publicly to his priests that she should be denied Holy Communion as is proper for the good of her soul. He is like the most loving guy. This is not an act of condemnation. It's an act hoping that she will turn back before she goes to hell because he cares about her soul. What does that say for the others who choose to give Holy Communion to people they know are in mortal sin when they know they are causing damnation to them because the scriptures say so. St. Paul in Corinthians, when we eat unworthily, we eat condemnation to ourselves. So what are they doing? Where is the love in that? It's strange. Desiderio Desideravi, exhortation by Pope Francis, was written, or excuse me, was released on the very day that post- no communion for you by Archbishop Cordelion to Nancy Pelosi his, uh, uh, in his diocese. So he is her bishop. She goes to the Vatican and she receives Holy Communion at a papal mass after meeting with Pope Francis. And Pope Francis knows because he said so in the papers when they asked him and he said there's a problem with that bishop. And... She receives Holy Communion that day, and that day he releases this document, Desiderio Desideravi, that says, basically, I'll paraphrase, all that's needed to receive Holy Communion is the garment of faith, which, if you look in the Catechism of the Council of Trent, is heresy. Exactly. Anathema heresy, which is fancy language that will use the term that Father used, but I won't use that one. <laughs> 
So it's very, very serious stuff, but these are official documents. So what do you do? It's very, very strange. Well, you do what Bishop Schneider, Bishop Strickland, and there was two others actually, Bishop Gracida, also from the United States, from Texas, but he's 100 now. And um, uh, there was another archbishop, I think it was Mutzatz. They got together and did this very courageous thing. So that was document number three. But I want to tell you about one that's near and dear to my heart, and it's relatively unknown. Does anybody know the fourth official document? Anybody here know the fourth official document that has heresy in it that was released by Pope Francis? It was released in 2018. And it's one of the biggest attacks on the pro-life movement in her history, and it comes straight from the Pope. It's called Gaudete et Exultate, and it's talking about immigration versus abortion as matters of importance in politics. And it says if anyone would say this, this is this is. And he's talking about um, he's talking about immigration of secondary importance. He says such considerations are worthy of a politician, but not a Christian. It is totally upside down and backwards. You know the document that was released by, under Pope John Paul II, by then Ratzinger, who became Benedict, in 2004. In 2004, while the American bishops were considering the question of communion for pro-abortion politicians, remember what happened? McCarrick was the head of the commission. <laughs> and the Vatican, under JP2, released a letter it was called Worthiness to Receive Holy Communion. And it was a beautiful letter that interestingly went through what Benedict would later call the essentials. And he said basically other issues like the death penalty, just war, are different than abortion and euthanasia. While you can disagree with the Pope on these other issues and still receive communion, still be a Catholic, not so with abortion and euthanasia. So he gave us very clear delineation. Things like immigration and how you want to handle helping the poor are for your own discernment, within reason, of course, but still not the same as abortion and euthanasia, for which there's no lines to delineate on, no. But yet, we're told in Gaudete et Exultate that immigration is an equal value. That's why when you hear Cardinal McElroy saying they're heretical because they don't regard uh, immigration on an equal level, he's got some documentation on his side. I hate telling you this because this is unreal. And I'm a simple Catholic dad. I'm not a theologian. You can't even ask me, what does this mean? Because I have no clue. But I do know I've got eight children. My eldest is 26. My youngest is 11. And I know it's my responsibility to fight for the faith of my kids. But what we do have to address at this time is the issue of the month. The month of the Sacred Heart of Jesus taken over as was the rainbow symbol by this movement, the alphabet movement, which has seemed to capture the imagination and hearts of so many people somehow, but also Pope Francis. And it's sort of unreal, but let me give you, to start with, a quote from another great leader in the church. His name is, in fact, he was your own nuncio. His name is Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano. <laughs> Just before our demonstration in Los Angeles with Bishop Strickland, which that man and his brother started, shame on you. I love that guy. And you should see his brother. Oh my gosh. I used to think, 
Jesse, you're so unique. And then I saw his brother. And I was like, my God, you guys should tag team, you know? And they were bo they're both fighters, too. Um, it was this statement that Archbishop Vigano released. He released it also because the Cardinal Archbishop of Washington, D.C. is allowing for an LGBT mass. And so he released a statement, and it's a long statement, so I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I want to read one part. Pastors led astray by homo heresy should remember that when they stand before the throne of God to be judged, they will have to give an account to our Lord for the souls who, because of them, have been damned for eternity. Souls for whom he shed his own blood on the cross. By confirming these poor souls in mortal sin, they have usurped the authority of Christ and the authority of the church for a purpose opposite to that which Christian charity demands, demonstrating thereby their own moral corruption along with that of those who let them act undisturbed to scatter the flock entrusted to them. The words of Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano. And the charge that he makes uses strong language, as does our beloved Father Altman. But it's not unwarranted. So everybody knows about the dubia, Cardinal Burke, Cardinal Kafara, Cardinal Meissner, and uh, the other, wait a minute, the fourth, Burke. Mueller. No, no, not Mueller. Meissner, Burke. And Brandmüller, thank you. And so, and there's only two left alive right now. Almost one because Burke almost didn't make it. But anyway, their dubia has gone unanswered now for years and years and years. But you know, there was another dubia answered really, really quickly. It was dubia sent from an LGBT group. Questions from an LGBT group headed up by a Catholic priest. His name is Father James Martin. He submitted questions to Francis from his new group, Outreach, and they were answered almost immediately. In fact, it gets so bad, it's surreal. James Martin had a conference, an LGBTQ++, whatever, whatever conference, on the feast day of the Sacred Heart, starting on June 16th, and it went for two days. And you know what's really weird? For that conference, he got a letter, handwritten letter, from Pope Francis, thanking him profusely for his work. These are weird things to say, but this is what we're living through. Do you remember right out of the gate, week one? Who am I to judge? Do you remember that? If you go to LifeSite, we like being on top of the news. You will not see that on LifeSite week one. Because if you remember, that happened in a conference that was not really authentic. It was sort of off the books. It wasn't reported officially. It was kind of like rumored. And... It was spicy, too, because it talked about a gay lobby in the Vatican. So it was interesting news, along with who am I to judge and a bunch of other things. But part of the other things was a comment about rosaries. The Pope was saying, and he's quite perturbed about someone counting their rosaries. You know, in the church, we have a tradition of giving a spiritual bouquet. When you give a bouquet, you give a number of roses to your loved one, three or six or a dozen or two dozen, depending on how much you're trying to impress or how bad you were. <laughs> but spiritual bouquets are there. 
And this fellow had gone to the Holy Father. Holy Father, we have a spiritual bouquet for you. We have like 3,000, whatever he said, rosaries. But in the interview, Pope Francis was said to have been mad. What's with the counting? Can't they just pray? So I said, no, that can't be the Holy Father. There's never going to be a Holy Father that's going to dislike the rosary. So no, we're not going with that because it's fake news. <laughs> a week later, I was in the Vatican, and we had a lot of contacts in the Vatican at that time. And I asked a source in the Vatican inside, and he was Latin American, so I thought, oh, I've got the inside skinny here. And he said, of course it was a real interview. But I said it wasn't released officially. Oh, no. The Holy Father will have a new means of communications. He has much more ways of communicating than you'll have seen previously. That, of course, is absolutely true. But it verified something absolutely horrific at the same time. Who am I to judge, though, did get the Holy Father on the cover of Advocate Magazine, one of the big gay magazines, with who am I to judge on his cheek? You know, you know they made it up. It got him cover of many magazines and newspapers because it was a new openness. Now, if you actually read what it was about, it was about a homosexual priest who got caught in an elevator and all sorts. You've got to read that story for yourself. It's way too long to tell. But you'd think after all of the confusion that it caused, we wouldn't go down that road again. But you know what we did? Who Am I to Judge was used over and over again by Pope Francis. But at that point, he would have known the reaction and the confusion that it caused, but nonetheless, it was there. But I need to tell you about Pope Francis' interaction in America. Do you remember he came to America in 2015? And there was amazing stuff going on in 2015 because you had a really heroic lady in Kentucky. Her name was Kim Davis. Kim Davis was a Kentucky clerk, and she was... She was a good evangelical woman, I think three or maybe four kids. She went to jail because she refused to put her signature on homosexual marriage licenses. <laughs> Your very good nuncio at the time thought this woman is great and probably thought, although I've never asked him about it, probably thought to himself, this good lady deserves the fullness of the truth, deserves to receive our Lord Jesus like we all get to. Because she loves him enough to suffer for him. And so he thought, I'm going to bring Kim Davis to meet the Holy Father so that she can be encouraged in what she did and maybe be interested in the church. So indeed, Archbishop Vigano brought Kim Davis to the nunciature to meet the Holy Father. And he did meet her. Something odd, though, he was, she was told they couldn't take any pictures. That's kind of unusual, but it is true. There's a Vatican photographer there who takes pictures all the time, and you can get them from them. So maybe they were trying to make the extra 25 bucks. I don't know. But, and she was also told she wasn't to say anything till he left. Maybe, who knows, created uproar. So, she obeys. After the Holy Father leaves in the plane, she makes it known that she was very pleased to meet Pope Francis and blah, blah, blah. Now, of course, at the time, your, your mainstream media here went crazy. What? The Pope met with a bigot and blah, blah, blah. But they said, you know, where's your photos? Well, actually, this happened first. They went to the Vatican for clarification. They were like, no, I can't confirm anything like that. Nope, sorry. Then they went back to her and said, what? They're saying, you know, where's the pictures? Oh, we don't have any pictures. We were told you couldn't ha take any. And then they were like, oh, Kim Davis is a liar now, too. The only problem for the Vatican was that her lawyer was with her at the, at the meeting. And so when her lawyer started to make noise, there was a new answer from the Vatican. Father Lombardi said, it was not an official meeting. The Holy Father only had one official meeting, and that was with his former student and his former student's family. So who was this former student? The Pope's former student was a man named Yayo Grassi. And Yayo Grassi did bring his mother and his sister. He also brought 
his homosexual partner. And you know what? There's photos, and actually there's video. There's video of this, and you can see Pope Francis embracing Yayo Grassi and his homosexual lover. So the story, unfortunately, doesn't even end there. There is a homosexual, uh, there's an abuse victim, a uh, clergy abuse victim, by the name of Juan Carlos Cruz. And Juan Carlos Cruz is a homosexual man. And Juan Carlos Cruz met the Holy Father, and he told the newspapers that the Pope told him that, because he talked to him about this Kim Davis thing, he was really upset. How could you meet with a bigot? And he explained to the New York Times, or Washington Post, I can't remember which one, I'm sorry. Um, he explained that the Pope told him, yeah, I didn't, I didn't know about the interview, the nuncio did it, and I got rid of that nuncio. So maybe you could say, ah, you know, that's one Carlos Cruz. Of course, the Holy Father met him. He was a sexual abuse victim. What do you think they'd do? You know, it's like, yeah, I'm sorry, son. I'm going to pat you on the head, and I'm going to cry with you. It's horrible what you experienced, but you're kind of crazy, so, you know, you could say anything. So he's not credible, except for the fact that Pope Francis put him onto the Vatican's Council for dealing with sexual abuse. So how? How can you make sense of this other than to believe that likely Pope Francis did say to him he got rid of Cardinal, uh, Maria Vigano because of the Kim Davis thing? But, you know, in 2015, LifeSite reported something, something really, really strange. And people said we made it up. Well, we had a photo, but we made it up. He, we reported that Pope Francis had invited a trans couple to the Vatican and had taken a photo with them Two women, one of whom had mutilated herself and given herself drugs to look like a man. And then he called them married and happy. So, you know, people said, oh, there's life sight again. But then something weird happened because in 2016 on the plane, he told the story himself out loud. <laughs> and then that photo from 2015 was everywhere. No one was saying it was a lie anymore, but I guess it was more acceptable. How can they be married? And how can you, as the Pope, say they're happy? But the trans thing is a big thing for Francis. Most people don't know, but he gave heavy praise to a nun who is called the nun of the trans. Because she does, she rescues poor trans couples. But she lets them live together in her apartment complex for them. And she does help the poor, but also doesn't help them spiritually, in fact, harms them spiritually. But then the Pope praises her work. On August 25th of last year, the Pope told the African, said in the media, the African bishops need a conversion <laughs> in the area of these anti-homosexual laws. Shortly thereafter, he went to Africa, and we were there. We were there in part because, how scary is this? America is trying to force all of Africa to bend on the very issues. So is all of Europe. So is my country of Canada, which is so sick. And they're telling them that if they don't bend on this, they're not going to get aid money. They're going to be starved to death, and they don't care what happens to them. But then, on top of that, to have the Pope tell them as well that they need to cave? I need to tell you what happened because we were there. I went to speak with the Archbishop of Kampala and um, his name is Semo Guerrere and he spoke to me about these laws being totally rational. It's what all of African culture is about. They're about love is between a man and a woman and there is nothing else. This is a foreign thing that's coming to invade us here. We found out something horrible in Uganda because they can't find the youth to say, oh, here are the gay kids in school and they're being persecuted. We need to make safe spaces for them. That's the argument that worked here, by the way. But they couldn't find those kids. So they recruit them. You want to know how they recruit them? They pay them to do 
gay porn. And they pay them very well, which over there means the world. These kids live in slums. They have no bathroom. They have a shack that they live in. And it's really sad. But they pulled them out of there. And, you know, for the video's sake, they're real skinny. And that is how they recruit. In fact, they then paid the one fellow who came out publicly and spoke about it, they paid him more to go and recruit from the school after they dragged him in. And he recruited kids. And the reason why he changed his mind is because some of the kids he recruited died. But this is what's happening there. So um, we were there, talked to him, went to Kenya, talked to the Archbishop Katui, uh, Archbishop of, uh, excuse me, the Bishop of Katui, who's the spokesman for the bishops in Kenya on the issue. And I wondered, are they going to stay strong? And I talked to one of the lead lawyers in Kenya, and he's just absolutely brilliant. And uh, Charles Kunjama, he said to me, I asked him that. I said, do you think they might give in? Because, you know, it's really, uh, this is a lot of pressure. And he said, 98% of their congregations agree with the law. It's our culture in Africa. There's no way they're going to give in. <laughs> and then get this, my host said, John Henry, don't you know the Anglicans have been trying to get their bishops here to cave on that issue for the last 30 years, and it still hasn't worked. Africa is standing strong on the family. Right after the Pope left, Jill Biden came to warn them. Right after Jill Biden left, they approved the law banning homosexuality. And then the US cut off aid to Uganda. And so did the UN. And now pray for Uganda because the ADF, a terrorist group from Congo, has just come in and slaughtered some of their children in the north. So pray for Uganda, but they are standing strong. St. Charles Luanga and Companions, who really, their blood. If anybody doesn't know the story of Charles Luanga and Companions who suffered because of homosexuality, you should look it up. And that's probably why Africa is standing strong on that issue. They could use help from us on liturgy, by the way, but that's a different story. Um, and then there was, of course, Pope Francis' civil union comments, which first people didn't believe that he did that when he was back in Argentina, but he repeated as Pope. So... It certainly does seem that we are in a situation that is extremely, extremely grave. Um, let me just see here. So I want to tell you something that was sort of hinted at by Anthony. When Anthony was speaking to us, he talked about the, um, the Trinity and what that means. Do you remember Our Lady of Fatima said, more souls go to hell because of sins of the flesh than for any other reason. Peter Kreef once said, do you ever notice that the whole culture war is about one issue? Abortion, homosexuality, embryonic stem cell research, pornography, divorce, adultery, the list goes on and on and on. It's all about sex. It's all about the family. It's all about marriage. Why? And as Anthony was saying, the fathers of the church, described in John Paul in um, his works, makes even more plain that the fathers talked about the Holy Trinity, the relationship to which we're all called in eternity, as a family. The father loves the son. The son, the father, and their mutual love is the person of the Holy Spirit, which is reflected in our father, mother, children. If you were Satan and you want your primary goal is to keep people away from heaven, which is that Trinitarian relationship, wouldn't it be your first goal to distort that very relationship? Absolutely. And that's the game plan. And that's why it has to be the place we have to concentrate our efforts 
in fighting the devil because it's where he's most successful. And Our Lady told us that. More souls go to hell because of that sin than for any other. I'm going to do a slight aside here. Do you know a lot of people say that, oh, this isn't the worst time. Come on. We had the Borgia popes. We had Arian. It was much worse in the olden days. I've got a line for you to respond to that. Our Lady of Fatima said, more souls go to hell because of sins of the flesh of impurity than for any other reason, right? So that's the number one tool of Satan. Something's weird with that. That was 1917 when she said it. Do you know that today there are more people on the planet who watch porn regularly than there were people alive in 1917? There's much more sin right now. And you can talk to some church historians. It's unreal what they'll tell you. Oh, that Pope Francis were to have maybe one or two women and some children. Because compared to this, that would be nothing. Oh, that we were to have just one heresy. But we have all of them in modernism. So we're dealing with some very, very serious times. But I'm not going to leave you with that because I want to leave you with what truly is our hope. So, but let me say this first. Where have we lost? Where has the church lost in its battle on communications? It's actually in the hard cases where it was believed prudent or convenient, caring or pastoral to be silent and appease the culture. And our good priests here weren't silent. But you know, that's how we lost. Because in the vast majority, bishops and priests in the West failed to make the argument against contraception for openness to life, failed to make the argument against in vitro fertilization, support for respect for God's ordained method of procreation, failed to make the argument against homosexual acts, and thus chastity in the midst of hard temptations, failed to make the argument against immodesty for the practice of custody of the eyes. And so what became of these lapses in teaching? Has the silence of the church led to cultural peace? No, no. The rampant practice of contraception has inevitably led to the abortion holocaust. The unchecked immodesty and total lack of custody of the eyes has brought us to the near universal addiction to pornography. In vitro fertilization gave us embryonic stem cell research. Homosexual acts by their acceptance have led to homosexual marriage and even restrictions on freedom of religious practice in various nations. So how do we deal with this? We've already gone through how to deal with this. It's very easy. It's caritas and veritate, the truth and love. It's the answer of Christ, of his mother, and of the church. It's not love to allow your children to rampantly misbehave without correcting them. It might be easier sometimes, but it's not love. I can tell you, as a father of eight children, it's often easier to turn the other way. But, you know, when you purposely fail to notice grave misbehavior, out of love, parents must correct and discipline their children, and so too the church, especially your shepherds, the father of souls. They must feed the flock. They must teach the truth, however difficult and politically incorrect, because that's love. We already heard today once, but it bears repeating. It's so obvious we're living in the time St. Paul warned about in 2 Timothy 4 when he said, they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, they will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. But the apostle of the Gentiles, St. Paul, he tells Timothy anyway, Timothy, the young bishop, to fulfill his ministry, he says, I charge thee before God and Jesus Christ, who shall judge the living and the dead by his coming and his kingdom. Preach the word, be insistent, in season and out of season. Reprove, entreat, rebuke in all patience and doctrine. These good priests in this room do just that, and for that they're canceled. And I am so proud to stand here with you guys because you are doing what so many of your brothers won't do, and you paid a price for that, and we all love you for it.
This is for you, fathers. Do you know that silence about these issues is actually specifically forbidden by the Vatican? Silence, not to go against them, which everybody seems to do nowadays, but silence is forbidden. The instruction is by Benedict XVI, um, and it was when he headed up the Congregation for Doctrine of Faith, so it was under JP2. And it says this, the CDF document from 86, entitled Letter to the Bishops of the Catholic Church on the Pastoral Care of Homosexual Persons. So it's a letter to bishops. And it says, clearly stating that homosexuality is immoral, is necessary. It's the instruction says, we wish to make it clear that departure from the church's teaching or silence about it in an effort to provide pastoral care is neither caring nor pastoral. Only what is true can ultimately be pastoral. The neglect of the church's position prevents homosexual men and women from receiving the care they need and deserve. And so the example of the Vatican and Pope Benedict at the time was amazing. In 2005, a few weeks before the election of Benedict, get this, the late Cardinal Alfonso Lopez Trujillo, who retained his position as president of the Pontifical Council for the Family after Pope Benedict got elected, he gave one of the strongest statements defending the traditional family ever voiced in the church. He said, Parliaments which open the way for same-sex marriage destroy piece by piece the institution of the family, the most vulnerable heritage of peoples and humanity. He called homosexual marriage a crime which represents the destruction of the world. And speaking of adoption of children by homosexual couples, he said, this would destroy, this is a direct quote, by the way, this would destroy the child's future. It would be an act of moral violence against the child. With those strong words, he awoke so many people to the dangers of the worldwide assault in the family. And the cardinal explained, though, now get this, this is the same cardinal. He explained that it was, not, it was actually out of love that the church was pointing out these dangers. Love not only for society, but also love for persons with homosexual attraction themselves. As I said many times, he said, homosexual peoples must be respected, loved, and assisted. We must help them overcome this situation if they seriously want to and help them realize that there is not only life on earth, there is another life. It is false to say that the church does not love these people. She loves them and wants to lead them to eternal salvation. Pope Benedict did the same. He talked about this. In December 22nd, 2008, Pope Benedict, he used like human ecology, the term human ecology, but he talked about respecting the creator's natural order of relationships between man and woman. And in language very similar to that of Cardinal Trujillo, the Holy Father said the church must protect man from self-destruction. And this is a quote again. If the church speaks of the nature of the human being as man and woman and demands that this order of creation be respected, this is not some antiquated metaphysics. What is involved here is faith in the creator and a readiness to listen to the language of creation. To disregard this would be the self-destruction of man himself, and hence the destruction of God's own work. And you know, obviously Benedict did not say this to be popular. In fact, he was so heavily condemned for this, there was actually thousands of news articles around the world, from Bulgaria to India, from the New York Times. I mean, it's, it was everywhere. They said, in a pink news headline was this, it read, Pope Benedict learned nothing from his time in the Hitler Youth. There was another headline, Pope Benedict's latest outburst justifies homophobic bullying and attacks. Those were the homosexual press, but the Main Street press was no less bad. San Francisco Chronicle, Pope Benedict at Christmas, preaching bigotry disguised as compassion. The Times of London, Christmas was never meant to be about this. So you, my dear canceled priests, are so maligned in the mainstream media, you're actually in very good company. With that, and with that company, you can already see a foreshadowing of our Lord's own promise to you in Matthew 5, 11 and 12. Blessed are you 
when they shall revile you and persecute you and speak all that is evil against you untruly for my sake, be glad and rejoice, for your reward is great in heaven. Do you remember the message from Our Lady of Fatima to Sister Lucia revealed by Cardinal Kafar that the final battle, the decisive battle between our Lord and the reign of Satan would be over marriage and the family? She also said, and since it's a decisive battle, you'll be persecuted for it. But she also said this, don't be afraid because anyone who works for the sanctity of marriage and family will always be fought and opposed in every way because this is a decisive issue. This battle was known and envisioned in the plan of our Lord. Do you know, more importantly, your participation in this battle was known. And you, all of you, are the chosen instruments of our Lord and Our Lady in this great battle. Remember what Sister Lucia said, Our Lady concluded, Our Lady has already crushed his head. And this is exactly where we find our hope as this revolution against God and the church comes to a fever pitch. It's in Our Lady. I'm so privileged to speak here between. <laughs> anyway, what did the greatest saints, or sorry, why? Why did the greatest saints pray to have lived in these times? They did. The time of the decisive battle between our Lord and the reign of Satan, which Cardinal Kafara, who received that letter from Lucia, said is on now since 2014. Here is what we must not only do to survive, but to thrive in the struggle, which has only just started, by the way, my friends. The greatest promoter of devotion to our Blessed Mother, St. Louis de Montfort, wrote about our times, and I'll quote this for you. I said that this will happen especially towards the end of the world, and indeed soon, because Almighty God and His Holy Mother are to raise up great saints who will surpass the holiness most other saints of most other saints as much as the cedars of Lebanon tower over little shrubs. These great souls, filled with grace and zeal, will be chosen to oppose the enemies of God who are raging on all sides. They will be exceptionally devoted to the Blessed Virgin, illumined by her light, strengthened by her food, guided by her spirit, supported by her arms, sheltered under her protection. They will fight with one hand and build with the other. With one hand, they will give battle, overthrowing and crushing heretics and their heresies, schismatics and their schisms, idolaters and their idolatries, sinners and their wickedness. With the other hand, they will build the temple of the true Solomon and the mystical city of God, namely the Blessed Virgin, who is called by the fathers of the church the temple of Solomon and the city of God. By word and example, they will draw all men to a true devotion to her, and through this will make many enemies." It will also bring about many victories and much glory to God alone. De Montfort added this. He said, It is true that on our way we have hard battles to fight and serious obstacles to overcome. But Mary, our mother and queen, stays close to her faithful servants. She is always at hand to brighten their darkness, clear away their doubts, strengthen them in their fears, sustain them in their combats and trials. Truly, in comparison with other ways, this virgin road to Jesus is a path of roses and sweet delights. But he asks, what will they be like, these servants, these slaves, these children of Mary? They will be ministers of the Lord who, like a flaming fire, will enkindle everywhere the fires of divine love. They will become in Mary's powerful hands like sharp arrows with which she will transfix her enemies. They will be as the children of Levi, thoroughly purified by the fire of great tribulations. Tribulations like being canceled. And closely joined to God, they will carry the gold of love in their heart, the frankincense of prayer in their mind, the myrrh of mortification in their body, they will bring to the poor and the lowly everywhere the sweet fragrance of Jesus, but they will bring the odor of death to the great, the rich, and the proud of this world. They will be like thunderclouds flying through the air at the slightest, slightest breath of the Holy Spirit, attached to nothing like you are now. 
surprised at nothing, troubled at nothing. They will shower down the rain of God's word and of eternal life. They will thunder against sin. They will storm against the world. They will strike down the devil and his followers. And for life and for death, they will pierce through and through with the two-edged sword of God's word all those against whom they are sent by Almighty God. They will be true apostles of the latter times to whom the Lord of hosts will give eloquence and strength to work wonders and carry off glorious spoils from his enemies. They will sleep without gold or silver and more important still, without concern in the midst of other priests, ecclesiastics, and clerics. Did you get that? They will sleep without gold or silver and more important still, without concern in the midst of other priests and ecclesiastics and clerics. Yet they will have the silver wings of the dove enabling them to go wherever the Holy Spirit calls them, filled as they are with the resolve to seek the glory of God and the salvation of souls wherever they preach. They will leave behind them nothing but the gold of love, which is the fulfillment of the whole law. Such are the great men who are to come by the will of God. Mary is to prepare them to extend his rule over the impious and unbelievers. So you know what? We have been handed a great gift by this revolution that's thought to destroy the faith. It's the gift of humility. You know, we can see with our own eyes the enemies arrayed against us are so much more powerful than we are. Any kind of like self-aggrandizement or self-assurance is truly laughable. Think about this. <laughs> the corporations fighting against life and family, they do so with unimagined wealth power, influence like we've never even heard of before. The power to spy on us at every moment of every day and use that information for their gain and our detriment. Imagine if that's the enemies we face here. Imagine what the spiritual enemies we face are like when they make all mankind look like nothing. So even with the hierarchy of the church, the very magisterium of the Pope stripped from us as an anchor of surety, we are left in our weakest and most vulnerable state. And that's exactly when God fights for us, when we put our full trust in him. We learn in the Magnificat why the Almighty chose Our Lady for his great works, because he said, for he has regarded the humility of his handmaid. And in her and with her and through her, we can all do all things for Christ, who is our strength. And there's not much to do to live, but to live our Catholic lives the way we know we should, daily mass, daily rosary, true devotion to Mary, which is nothing more than an utter reliance on her for everything and with everything we have. It's actually in that simplicity of total consecration that the secret to this battle lies. Total giving of yourself and recognition of your total weakness and dependence and total trust in that living city of God, as Our Lady is called. In the book of the Apocalypse, chapter 11, we read that the two witnesses or two end-time prophets who are able to battle against the Antichrist, they are able to withstand him until nearly the end when they are slain by him. And in verse 10, we learn that after they are killed, their bodies lie in the streets. And the world exchanges gifts celebrating their deaths because they tormented the people. What in the world did they, how did they torment the people? Well, we're given a hint. There's an answer in the book of Wisdom when it mystically de describes the reason for the crucifixion of Christ, they say, let us lay traps for him, the upright man, since he annoys us and opposes our way of life, reproaches us for our sins against the law and causes us and accuses us of sins against our upbringing. He claims to have knowledge of God and calls himself the child of the Lord. We see him as a reproof to our way of thinking. The very sight of him weighs our spirits down for his kind of life is not like other people's and his ways are, not, are quite different. In his opinion, we are counterfeit. He avoids our ways as he would filth. He proclaims the final end of the upright as blessed and boasts of having God as his father. So as de Montfort reveals, the key to the city of God is to Our Lady, is to imitate her humility. Mary's power of the evil spirits, he said, will especially shine forth in the latter times when Satan will lie and wait for her heel, that is, for her humble servants and her poor children, whom she will rouse to fight against him. In the eyes of the world, they will be little and poor, like the heel, the heel of the foot, lowly 
in the eyes of all, downtrodden and crushed, as is the heel by the other parts of the body. So let us cherish our littleness, our total weakness against the forces arrayed against us, but our total reliance and dependence and absolute need for God. Let us take the lowest place in the army of Mary. Let us approach Christ always through his most holy mother. Let us address our Father in heaven by the words of de Montfort. Behold not me, but behold the handmaid of the Lord, who acts for me and gives me a singular confidence and hope with thy majesty. I thank you, my friends.